Doctor the Past with Starfish. We are on page 219. On the run. Catalina is at the door talking so quickly and crying so hard. It takes several minutes for me to understand what she's saying. Somehow, Gigi got out of the gate. Catalina saw her chasing the neighborhood squirrel. I ran after her. She ran faster. Thought it was a game. I couldn't catch her. I'm so sorry. I round up Anise and Dad. Catalina recruits her family. We divide up, scour the neighborhood. Catalina's family goes door to door. Anise checks yards. I jump in Dad's pickup with the windows down. We coast around block after block, calling out Gigi's name and stopping to look in the bushes and culverts and check around the trash cans. Hours later, I'm no longer calling out her name. Just saying in between sobs, Gigi, please come home. Gigi's gone, but I'm lost. Starfish in distress. We give up the search close to midnight. We'll find Gigi, Dad says, giving me a hug before going to bed. And then I'll make us some soup out of that stupid squirrel. He's trying to help. It's not working. I can't sleep. All night long, I leave voicemails for and send emails to every shelter, rescue, and vet I can find on the internet. When the sun comes up, I stare out my bedroom window, hoping a bird's eye view will help me spot Gigi. No use. Exhausted, I collapse onto my bed. I ball up, a starfish curling in its feet, showing signs of distress. The plan. I sit straight up when I get the text. Have your dog come alone. I don't recognize the cell number, but I know that address. It's just my luck that the person who found Gigi is someone who would hold an innocent dog for ransom just to be mean. I will never understand how some people can be so cruel. They have no right to keep making my life miserable. I have the power to stop this. I come up with the plan. Held for ransom. I pound on the door. Marissa opens it. Give me my dog. Gigi's squirming. I reach for her. Courtney blocks me. Not so fast. Gigi whimpers. Her tongue hangs out as she pants, overheating from panic. Give me my dog. She must be hangry, Marissa says. It just so happens we have a snack. Courtney leaves and comes back to the door holding a whale-shaped cake. Eat it, Marissa barks. All of it. If you want your dog back, I focus on Gigi. It's okay, I assure her. Yeah, it's okay, Gigi, Marissa says. As long as Splash pays your ransom, we're about to find out just how much you're worth. Eat the cake, blubber belly. Marissa swings Gigi by her harness. She runs midair and reverse sneezes. What was that? Courtney asks. Who knows? Marissa rolls her eyes. It makes all kinds of weird noises, not unlike Splash over here. Eat, disgusting well, eat. Gigi doesn't take her eyes off of me. She trusts me. Trusts me like I trust water. I do anything for her. Courtney places the cake in front of my mouth. Marissa and Gigi up in the air and barely... Marissa throws Gigi up in the air and barely catches her before she starts making a video with her phone. I'm not going to eat that, I say. Splash says for the first time ever. Marissa laughs. And I'm not going to let either of you bully me ever again. You two think you're better than me, but you're just pathetic. Look at all you did to try to get at me. All the time you spent planning this. The money you forked over for the cake. I laugh and lean in. But enough about you two. Now give me my dog. Outnumbered. It all happened so fast. Courtney holds the cake closer to me. I flip it back, smashing cake all over her face. Clumps of frosting fall off and land on her feet. She scoops away chunks from her mouth and nose. I can't believe you did that. I defended myself. I closed in on Marissa. I said, give me my dog. Make me. It's two against one. So you're out of luck, loser. I think your mask's off, Catalina says, appearing all of a sudden at my side. Look like it's two against two, three against two. Anise shows up and locks arms with her. Six against two, Javier, Nat, and Izzy say. K. 
captured on video, Gigi covers me in kisses all the way home. They didn't get the video they planned on, but I made a great one, Catalina says. L take a look. It's short and shows the cake smashing against Courtney's face. It plays forward and backwards over and over. I'm tempted to post it on social media, but that would be attacking Marissa and Courtney and not defending myself. So I just sent it to Viv. I'm pretty sure I hear her laughing clear from Indiana. Hasn't had her shot. I tell dad Gigi needs to get go to the vet. I don't think Marissa, Marissa's had her shots. The vet finds a small scratch on one eye, probably from Gigi, crawling around the bushes as she's chased the squirrel. Eye drops will make it better, so physically she's okay. Mentally she's not. When I go for a swim, she who hates water whines to join me. She lies on my stomach as I float, trusting me more than ever. I feel guilty. What happened to her is my fault because I'm fat. That's wrong thinking. I replaced my thought. What happened to Gigi was because Marissa and Courtney are mean girls. Behold the thing. I'm sitting on my bed with my back to the door as I brush my hair. The bristles hit the mother of all tangles. I winch. I can help. Mom sits next to me. I reluctantly hand her the brush. She works one section at a time, careful not to tug. I close my eyes as the brush massages my scalp, relaxing, soothing, comforting. Words not usually associated with mom. I didn't realize how bad it was getting for you. The chair, the Photoshop picture, those weren't clues. And you see how I get treated. Sometimes you even blame me for the way others treat me. That's wrong, mom. But what's worse is the way you treat me. You can be my worst bully. Mom hangs her head. Mom hangs down her head. I realize now I've been saying the wrong things. I've always been better at writing than talking. I guess that's why I like being a writer. With writing, I can take the time to find the right words and not blurt out something I might not even mean. I've never been great at talking. No argument there. Mom laughs. You're good with words. Just be careful to use them as tools, not weapons. I jump up. Great point, Mom. I look her in the eyes. You need to remember it, too. Do you know what it feels like to be called a big old fat thing? I lean in. Thing. I say it softer, slower. I pull away. Starfish. Make myself as big as I can. Take a good look, Mom. I turn in a circle. Once, twice, three times. Am I just a thing to you? Behold the thing! Mom buries her face in her hands. I'm so, I'm sorry, so very sorry. Thing is a horrible word. It should never be used to describe a person. I wish I could take back every, ever saying that. I honestly never meant to hurt you, ever. I flop down on the bed, exhausted. I want to believe her, but I can't trust her. She tries to hug me, but I jerk away. The hurt's still too deep. After mom shuts the door behind her, Gigi curls up against my neck, and we both fall into a deep sleep. Proud of me. At my next session with Doc, I tell her about Gigi and standing up to Marissa and Courtney. You defended yourself without attacking them. You did great. And that's not all. I give Doc the play-by-play, -play, tell her how I confronted Mom. When I get to the part about behold the thing, Doc stops taking notes, slides one hand up under her reading glasses, and presses on her tear ducts. Just like that, Mom wanted to hug me as if, as if everything's fine now. Doc finishes my sentence. I nod. I feel better, but not okay. I think there's more I want to say. Well, work on it, Doc hands me a notebook and tells me what to do. And Ellie, I'm so proud of you. If only mom could say that. I'm ready. Enough, enough. Catalina stops strumming her guitar, plunks it down on a patio chair, jumps into the pool and puts her hand out like a stop sign. I stop swimming laps. Spill it, she says, as we tread water. I play stupid. Spill what? 
Don't even. I know you. Something's wrong. You hardly said a word in days, even though I have some seriously mad conversation skills and can talk enough for the both of us. I'm getting tired of hearing myself speak. For several minutes, the only sound between us is Gigi snoring, snuggled up on my beach towel by the steps. Yikes. It's something big, isn't it? Catalina swims closer to me. I nod. My therapist wants me to confront mom. Wowza! I dread it. But you need to, Ellie. You really do. I don't know how you've put up with it this long. What if it doesn't change anything? What if it makes matters worse? What if it helps? What if things get better? I hadn't thought of it. You're right. I always am. I laugh for the first time since Doc told me I needed to confront mom. How can I help? Catalina asked. I need to figure out what I'm going to say. Practice on me. Pretend I'm your mom. So that's what we do for days. I rehearse my words with Catalina during the laps in the pool and at night with Gigi, who cocks her head from side to side, listening to my every word. I write them down, too, in case I get all nervous and forget what I want to say. When the time comes, I'm ready. This is my time. Doc and I have company for today's session. Doc directs dad and mom to two chairs, not usually in the office. Doc rolls her chair close to me. To be clear, you're here because Ellie asked you to come. I'm here to provide any support she needs to express her feelings about things that have happened, about words that have been said. Dad and mom nod in understanding. Ellie, whatever, whenever you're ready, begin. I fold and unfold the bullet point list of what I plan to stay, say. As I look it over, I realize I've been preparing for a trial, offering up a defense of why I should be loved. I toss it into the trash. I curl and uncurl the throw pillows, tassels around my fingers. I don't feel like you love me, Mom. Mom leans forward, starts to say something. I stop her. No. You've said enough. This is my time to talk. Weight of words. I control my breathing like Doc and I have been practicing. Mom, I don't feel like you'll ever love me, can ever love me, unless I lose weight. I reach for a tissue as the words catch in my throat. I used to think I needed you to love me or I would be incomplete. The tears flow. I don't blink them back or try to hide or bury them. I take my time, feel them, each and every drop, feel them drain the pain. When my tears taper off, I look over at Doc. You're doing great. Need a break? Need to take a break? I shake my head, start again. I have people in my life who love me, so I'll be okay. I smile at Dad. He reaches for his bandana and dabs his eyes. I clear my throat to make sure mom hears my final words. And I'm learning to love me. The fat on my body never felt as heavy as your words on my heart. I walk over to her and place her hands, place in her hands a notebook full of all the ugly words she's ever said to me. It's time for you to carry the weight. She crumbles. Catching a break. Fun news, Viv texts a photo of her with sunshine yellow hair striped with orange rays. Viv texts again, bad news, dad gets me for spring break. And again, good news, that means I get to visit you. That's not good news. I text, what? That's the best news ever. Wailing wall. On the drive to pick up Viv from her dad's place, I spot something and make Anise circle back. Sometimes when you see something all the time, you forget it's there. Like the Wailing Wall in downtown Dallas, an outdoor mural featuring humpbacks. I feel so small looking up at them. They swim. They're smart. They have huge hearts. They have a voice. I've always hated being called a whale, but it's actually a compliment. They're big, they're amazing creatures, and they're beautiful. Three times the fun. What's better than a cannonball? Three cannonballs. 
Catalina gets an A for originality. She leaps into the air and flaps her arms like a newborn duckling. Its wings pretty much useless for flight, but at least it feels like it's doing something to try to save itself as it falls. Viv starts out well, but lets go of her legs too soon and ends up doing a cannonball belly flop. Not to brag, but I nail it. Perfect form, perfect splash. Room for starfish. I swim so often my two besties, Viv and Catalina, tuck her out before I do. I drift over them and we stare at the sky, the ocean of the heavens. I tell Viv and Catalina about starfishing, how I'm not going to try to hide myself or make myself small anymore, how I'm proud to be me and to claim my right to take up space. I deserve to be seen. I deserve to be noticed. I deserve to be heard, to be treated like a human. I, starfish, there's plenty of room for each of us, each and every one of us in the world. And that's it, guys. That was Starfish by Lisa Phipps. See you next time.